cows, especially dairy cows, were being fed additional protein so they, they produced more milk. The protein was composed mostly of something called meat and bone meal, which included carcasses from sheep and cows. So dead cows were being recy recycled into the feed of living cows. And somehow, and it's still not clear exactly where the prion that caused this disease came from, but somehow infectious prions started to be incorporated in this meat and bone meal. And it was eventually calculated that an amount less than the size of a peppercorn would cause the disease. And when you consider that cows were being fed quite a lot of this stuff, it's no wonder that this disease spread like crazy. It was a huge disaster for the British livestock industry. And of course, we've had our own cases here, 17 cases over the last, uh, I guess, seven or eight years. Uh, but once some controls were put on meat and bone meal, no longer feed that to cattle, they did that, and then it seemed like there were still more cases. And what was happening apparently was that other livestock were being given meat and bone meal, like pigs, because they were seemingly immune to the disease. But somehow that would get mixed up at the farm and the cows would get it and the cows would die. So eventually a set of controls was put in so that cows were no longer ingesting these infectious agents. And as you can see, then the disease started to fall off. But there were huge concerns because if, if the mad cow disease agent was actually the same one as caused scrapie, then really humans wouldn't have to worry because for 250 years, sheep had been dying of this disease in England. People were eating those sheep. Nobody ever got sick. But it wasn't actually clear it was the same agent. And if it were something more like the Kuru agent, maybe humans were at risk. The government was, the British government was in a, a very tight bind. First of all, they didn't even want other countries to know that their cattle at first were being affected by any kind of disease, because then their beef exports would be cut off. Secondly, they were not wanting to believe that humans who ate beef from cows that were perhaps slaughtered while they were still incubating the disease but hadn't shown signs of the disease yet, could get the disease. There were, there are estimates, so as I said, 180,000, 180,000, there were vast stacks of carcasses being burned in the English countryside. It was a phenomenal experience. 180,000 died, but it's estimated that perhaps a million or more cows were actually infected, and obviously the majority of those could well have gone into the human food supply. However, as I said, the British government was uh, trying to get out the message. So in the year 2000, this is John Gummer, who was uh, agriculture minister. That's his daughter, Cordelia. And in this incident that he, I'm sure, regret, I'm sure regrets now, he encouraged her to eat a hamburger, saying British beef is safe. Uh, fortunately, she didn't become ill, but Shortly after he did this, the British government acknowledged that, in fact, people were, I'm sorry, this must have been, uh, yeah, pe uh, people were becoming ill from the human version of mad cow disease. Now, if I can show you another graph, I'll just show you. So there's the, there's the BSE mad cow disease numbers. These represent the human version of that disease. Now, the numbers are not gigantic. Uh, to date, around the world, about 200 people have died, 170 in England. But still, it was a terrible, it's a terrible disease. It uh, strikes young people, not like the traditional form. It's called variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. But instead of striking people 60 and older, it, it can strike 20-year-olds. And it's firmly believe now that this disease was caused by eating meat that was somehow contaminated with mad cow disease prions. That epidemic, 
uh, is now also dying out. The latest figures were, I think, two or three people in 2010 in England have died of variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So, what about the agents themselves? I've given you two examples. Kuru, where somehow consuming infected brain tissue gave you the disease. There's scrapie, which nobody's really sure how that gets transmitted from sheep to sheep. And then in the case of mad cow disease, it was cows eating recycled infected cow material, and then in turn humans, unfortunate enough to eat hamburger or beef stew or any one of sausage or any one of those products that might have bits of spinal cord and so on in it all through the 80s. You know, I, when I was with Quirks and Quirks, I spent two weeks every year in England. I'm sure I ate lots of those products and I'm not allowed to give blood now just in case I am incubating uh, some of those uh, prions. If I have time later, I'll explain how one's genetics determines how likely you are to get it or how long your incubation period might be. Now, I'd like to talk about prions themselves. And there's a big issue when you talk about prions because they exist, they're molecules. So they exist at a size that's very, very hard to envision. And yet if you don't sort of get that picture, then you can't really understand why these are not only so important, but so fascinating at the same time. So this is just, I'm sorry, this slide in this particular lighting doesn't, isn't really all that clear, but these are, this is a mass of human cells. And, you know, a human cell, you really need one of those tabletop, like a light microscope to be able to see clearly. Here's another image. Each of these is an individual cell. That would be a very, very powerful microscope that would allow you to see them at that magnification. But so cells are just beyond our ability uh, to make, it, make them out. You, you do need a light microscope. So take away the complexity of cells being bunched with each other. And this is a same sort of size scale. This is a single neuron, a single brain cell. They're quite elaborate. There's a cell body right there in the middle from which there are a variety of extensions. Now there's another image. This is, uh, these are drawings by a guy named Alex Tirabasso at the Museum of Nature in Ottawa. So there's a network of neurons. Now of course this is somewhat unrealistic because in a real brain, the whole space would be packed with cells and molecules of a variety of kinds. So this gives you a sense. And if we focus on this particular neuron that's lit up, and we go in a little bit closer, so we're still operating at the you know, in a, in a tabletop microscope, you could see this. But if we go in dramatically closer, like this, then what he's diagrammed here are some features of the surface of the cell, which include these little areas, uh, which are raft-like uh, objects sort of floating in the surface of the cell. And those blue dots, which you're going to see a little bit bigger in a second, are what are called prion proteins. They, these are not the infectious agent. These are normal protein molecules that sit on the surface of neur neurons, many different tissues, but mostly neurons in our brains. And they have some sort of function, which actually isn't really clear yet. There are lots of ideas about what they do normally for our brain cells. But the point is, they are there, we all have them, we have them by the millions in our brains, and they're not causing us any problem. These are the normal prion proteins. Here's another view, just to give you a sense. They're packed, they're actually anchored to the surface of the neuron by these little molecular connectors. And what you can't tell from, I, I think this is a really nice way of depicting them, but what you, what you really can't tell from this image is that they're, um, they're folded up. So let me, let me demonstrate. Each of these blue blobs is a protein molecule made up of a series of subunits. And this little thing that I crafted is actually exactly the right number. So in a protein, every one of these is something called an amino acid. But that doesn't really matter. 
these all start when they're made as a single chain and then they fold up like this until they have essentially that kind of shape. They have to fold to be able to do whatever it is that they do. So if they're, for instance, they are to receive some sort of molecule that comes in as a signal, they've got to have exactly the right little cavity in the right place. The sequence of amino acids determines how they'll fold, and once they're folded, they work brilliantly. Now I'm going to show you a different animation. I'll give you a sense of how complicated, because folding is what this is all about. It's going to show you how complicated the folding is. So imagine the end product are these normal prion proteins sitting on a brain cell. You have 10 billion brain cells, so you've got a lot of these. Here is roughly what, starting with the chain, one of these prion proteins is like as it continues to fold. This is animation by scientist named Vikram Mulligan at the University of Toronto. And you'll see as it's incredibly complex, this process. And you know, to be honest, I don't think anybody can be absolutely sure that every step of this is exactly as it happens in your body. But you end up with something that looks like that. It's got coils, it's got twists, it's got turns. That particular shape is, is all guided by the exact sequence of amino acids. If you change the sequence, you would change the shape. And that, imagine those going back to the previous scene. You have those embedded in a neuron. Everything is fine to this point. But for reasons, or with mechanisms that are not quite well worked out yet, this proper folding can be changed and a prion protein can be misfolded. And the misfolding, nobody really knows how it works because when they misfold, they aggregate and they get clumped. You can't really separate them and no matter what sort of tools you use, whether they're super powerful electron microscopes or anything else. But something like this happens and maybe where you have the coils before you've got sheets, the protein has changed. Now this, then they start to aggregate like that. And this is the heart of the disease process. So in all those diseases that I've talked about, Kuru, what people were consuming in that brain tissue of the deceased were misfolded prion proteins, which now just get the name prion. <coughs> misfolded. Same in scrapie, same in mad cow disease. The cows were dying because they were ingesting misfolded proteins. And the thing is, it, that's not enough, but the misfolded ones recruit the normal ones, cause them to misfold, and so you get a kind of chain reaction. Let me demonstrate. So there's really two, two sort of states that a prion, this prion molecule can exist in. One, it's folded. Now I would use this mouse trap to illustrate. So the normal one is folded up like this. It'd be quite spectacular if I blew this. But then there's one other state when it when it misfolds, it snaps into that misfolded shape and it's changed and it becomes infectious. So, you know, imagine this is the surface of a neuron covered with normal prion proteins. And I have a misfolded one here, and it comes in contact. <laughs> that worked a lot better than I thought it was going to be. 